Good afternoon, and thank you for coming to our infertility problem. For the past five weeks, we were tasked with diagnosing Georgia, a female, 21 years of age, and Robert, 48, who, and they believe they are infertile. We were all required to attend a lab, a technology lab, where we were had to use Photoshop and create an image of the male and female reproductive system. In Tudor Group, we also read The Bike by Lance Armstrong, the famous bicyclist and his wife's kit, kit infertility and journey through in vitro. For five weeks, we have researched, collected data, and studied all about the infertility. All about infertility. Now we will have Alexis and Nicolette present to you about infertility and the background of Georgia and Robert. All right, so I'm Taryn, and I'm Adam, and, and you just heard the basics of infertility, but you can't really understand how the reproductive system malfunctions until you understand how the reproductive system works properly. We will be talking about the main parts, their functions, how they work, and the metric cycle. All right, so the main parts. There are five main parts to the female reproductive system. There's the vagina, the cervix, the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries. The function of the ovaries is to produce reproductive hormones such as estrogen and progesterone, and the ovaries also produce the eggs. The fallopian tubes provide a path of travel, if you will, for the eggs. The uterus is where the eggs develop into a child. The cervix separates the uterus and the vagina, and also opens up during the birthing canal during childbirth. The vagina is also part of the birthing canal, and provides sensation and lubrication during intercourse. So sperm enters the female reproductive system through the vagina. From there it travels up through the cervix, through the uterus, through the fallopian tubes, and meets with an egg somewhere in the fallopian tubes if the female is ovulating. You'll hear more about ovulation from Ivan in a couple of minutes. After the egg has been fertilized from sperm, it travels from the fallopian tubes and implants itself 
into the walls of the uterus or the endometrium to develop into an embryo or something unborn in the process of development. It usually takes about nine months for the egg to develop into a child, and after the nine month incubation period, the child is pushed out of the uterus head first. Um, I'll be talking about the menstrual cycle. Uh, there are four phases of the menstrual cycle. And the first phase is menstruation. And menstruation is when the endometrium or, uh, or the endometrium flushes out all of the blood and uh, mucus to uh, make the wall of the uterus. And this can take anywhere from two to seven days. The second phase in the cycle is the follicular phase, and this is when two or, uh, follicles grow or eggs, and they grow in the ovaries, and they will uh, only one will fully mature, and then the rest will just die out or uh, disintegrate. And if uh, they make if, if they make their way down the fallopian tube, they will be fertilized and be ready for. Uh, like a baby. And the third phase is ovulation, which is, the ovulation is when the little uh, the little eggs uh, fill, uh, the little eggs full of fluid are uh, fertilized by the sperm and are making their way down the floor of the tubes. And she's only, well, the woman's only uh, fertile for 12 to 24 hours. And the eggs are only fertile for 12 to 24 hours. Eggs are only fertile for 12 to 24 hours in this cycle, which can take uh, a few, work, which can take four days. The the last cycle, last uh, phase in the cycle is the luteal phase, phase, and this phase is uh, this phase is the phase that kind of determines if you're going to be pregnant or not, and uh, and this. Phase is called a, or this, um, we, we need to come in. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, there, in the menstrual cycle, there are two, uh, two uh, main oh, hormone, hormones, and the first hormone, hormone is uh, progesterone, and this progesterone, uh, it thickens the endometrium wall, uh, and as, at the beginning of, menst of the menstrual phase, the during menstruation, the the progesterone levels go up, and then once it hits ovulation in the phase, they start to go down, and then a hormone called uh, estrogen starts to <coughs> the estrogen le levels start to come up, and the estrogen is the hormone that tells the brain it is time to ovulate, and moves the it helps move the eggs down the or the egg down the fallopian tube. So, um, in conclusion, me and Taryn have talked about the main parts, the functions of these parts, how it works, and much of And up next is Phoebe with what can make a female infertile. Hello, my name is Phoebe, and I will be going over the causes of women's infertility. There are many ways a woman can become infertile. But the main ways a woman can be is due to um, ovulation problems, S ovulation problems, endometriosis, poor egg quality, STDs, blockage of the fallopian tubes, and polycystic ovary syndrome, which is also known as PCOS. Like I said, one of the main reasons a female a female infertility is due to ovulation problems. Pretty much what it is is when the ovary does not release an egg every single month like it is supposed to. Some causes for it may be the ovaries do not produce enough estrogen. You might have diabetes. You might be obese. Or it could even be due to certain kinds of medications like antidepressants. And maybe even early menopause, which is when the egg release too early. Possible symptoms may be the absent or infrequent periods or abnormally light or heavy bleeding. But luckily there are treatments. One is called clomiphene, which is a drug to stimulate or trigger your ovulation. 
Some alternatives or solutions besides, <coughs> besides <coughs> chromophene would be in vitro fertilization, which I'm going to call IVF, and also adoption. <coughs> Next is endometriosis. Endometriosis is when the endometrial tissue, which is the inner lining of the uterus, um, grows in other places in the pelvic and abdominal region. Like, here are where it can grow and stuff. The actual cause of it is unknown, but some symptoms for it may be painful menstrual periods or intercourse, heavy bleeding or unusual spotting, and general, general pelvic pain. A symptom can even be no symptoms besides showing like some po another possible symptom could be not having any symptoms besides knowing you can't get pregnant. Some treatments for it are horm hormone therapy, surgical treatment, and pain medications. Next is poor egg quality. Poor egg quality is when the quality of the egg decreases, which is mostly due to your age. So the older you get, the less and quality you get from it. And it mostly starts from your early 30s to early 40s in that area, which is when the quality of it decreases dramatically. There are no symptoms in it. And so treatments for our IVF using donor eggs and embryos or adoption. Next is STDs. STDs are caused by infections that are passed from one person to another during sexual contact. A few we have mainly put our focus on in the past five weeks are chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and HPV. And I just wanted to let you know that you cannot get an SV by being monogamous, which is when you and the other person you are having sexual intercourse with are both virgins. And I'm just going to be doing a brief part of STDs because we'll be getting to that later in the presentation. And it can also cause many health problems. It can do health problems to men, but it could be more severe in women. Like let's say you are pregnant. If you have an SV while you are in pregnancy, it could do serious health issues to your baby. And I will talk about symptoms and treatments, but we will be talking about that later on. And here is a healthy cervix. Um, and here is a cervix infected with chlamydia. And here's a cervix infected with gonorrhea. So there's like blisters and stuff around it. And here's, syphilis doesn't really do any cause to the cervix, but you can get sores all over your hands and feet. Like what Taryn and Ivan were talking about, the fallopian tubes, that is the pathway an egg takes to make its way to the uterus, hopefully. If there's any blockage in that area, it obvious, the egg cannot obviously go to where it needs to go. Pelvic inflammatory disease, which is also known as PID. Pre previous surgeries in, in, in abdomen or pelvis, and even pelvic tuberculosis, which is a major cause worldwide, but it's not really, but is uncommon in the United States, are can cause blockages of fallopian tubes. Treatments for blocked tubes are arthroscopic surgery, which will be explained later, and fertility drugs. Adoption is always a option too. Lastly is polycystic ovary syndrome. It is a common, sorry, Polycystic ovary syndrome is a common endocrine system disorder among women of reproductive age. Endocrine system, endocrine system is a collection of glands of an organism that secrete hormones directly into the circulatory system. Doctors don't exactly know what causes PCOS, but some factors that might play a role in is excess insulin, low-grade inflammation, and heredity. Symptoms of it are irregular periods, thinning on your hair on your scalp, weight problems, or even excess or unwanted body or facial hair growth. Treatments for it 
are treatments for polycystic ovary syndrome can be sorry are birth control treatments to regulate your menstruation, insulin sensitizing medications, and androgen blocking medications and ovulation induction. There are many more ones, but I believe these are the most important. And here's a normal ovary, and here's an ovary infected with PCOS. I just went over all the causes of fetal infertility, which are ovulation problems, endometriosis, poor egg quality, STDs, blocked to the fallopian tubes, and PCOS. Now it is time to talk about the male reproductive system with Elijah. <coughs> I am Elijah and I'm going to be talking about the male reproductive system. This is the diagram that I made. <coughs> so I'm going to be talking about the parts of the male reproductive reproductive system, which include the penis, the corpus cavernosum, testicles, the epididymis, the duct vas deferens, seminal vesicle, prostate, and urethra. And then I'm going to explain the whole course using that diagram. So the penis is used for intercourse, and it is used for, for your tissues, bathroom. Corpus cavernosum is where all the blood goes to cause an erection. Sterility can happen here if you have low blood flow to this area and if you have erectile dysfunction. The testicles is where the sperm is produced and it also produces hormones such as testosterone and sterility can also happen here if you have low sperm count or low testosterone. The epididymis is where the sperm is sent for a couple days to mature after release from the testicles. The duct vas deferens is the duct that the semen and sperm uses to go to the epididymis. The, the seminal vesicle is where the sperm and mixes with the semen so that it can continue its way out and the prostate regulates the sperm and the semen and it also regulates whether sperm and semen or urine comes out and there's muscles that tighten and tighten quote open when one of the two is coming out. The veritha is the course that either the sperm and semen or the urine come out. So the sperm starts in the testicles, then it gets sent to the epididymis to mature for a few days. Then it goes through the duct, vas deferens all the way to the seminal vesicle. And then the prostate lets it out through the urethra, and then it gets ejaculated out at the end. So now that you understand, have an understanding about the female anatomy parts, here's Sonia with Cerulean <laughs> Some infections can mess with the sperm's production and or the sperm's health. Ejaculation when the sperm goes into the bladder and they go into the penis. Antibodies. Anti-sperm antibodies ident identify this sperm and attack the sperm. Tumors and cancer. Penile cancer is 
a disease in which the cancers form inside the pe the penis and the sperm can't go out. Right? Hormone imbalance. The males create a hormone called testosterone, and after their twentieth year of age, the testosterone level drops, and every ten years, fourteen percent of the testosterone level is gone. The diet. Males who drink at least a quart of Coca-Cola daily have 30% less sperm than males who don't drink Coca-Cola. Males who eat large quantity of, quantities of soy-based foods have 30% less sperm than males who don't eat soy-based foods. Males who eat fatty acid, or also known as omega-3, have 98% less sperm. Males who eat traditional, traditional Dutch diets and fish and produce produce-based diets have twice as much sperm. And hot tubs, frequent use of hot tubs or saunas can 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 lower temporarily temporarily lower your sperm count because your sperm is much better at a certain temperature. And then, Low sperm count. What is low sperm count? When the fluid, semen, while, ej while ejaculation, the semen has less sperm count than normal. What causes less sperm count? The doctors and nobody really knows what causes low sperm count. And here are some facts about sterility in men. It could be temporary temporary or permanent and depending it depending on the drugs you have taken and the doses dose is and your age. Um, some drugs that could affect this is marijuana could temporarily lower your sperm count and steroids they shrink your testicles and they lower your sperm count permanently. And one third of all cases are the male's problem. And one third is the female's problem. And one third is both the problems. They both have this problem. And now we have Weston and Jordan. Oh, wait, okay, sorry. So I went over the sterility in men, what causes sterility in men, what is low sperm count, and what causes low sperm count. Now we have Hello, I'm Weston. I'm Jordan, and we'll be talking about STDs. Uh, so we had a guest speaker, her name was Hillary Cage, and she was with the county health department. She mostly talked about STDs when she came here. Uh, she mostly talked about two because they're the most common for infertility, and those were gonorrhea and chlamydia. Uh, then what this shows is how many people in the world um, have STDs. I have all of these numbers up, and it uh, is 199 billion people. <clears throat> what we're going to talk about is the STDs, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, HPV in general, warts, herpes, and the transmission of these. What are STDs? <clears throat> it is a sexually transmitted disease or infection that are spread by sexual behavior, which is vaginal, anal, and oral intercourse. How these are transmitted between people? <clears throat> STDs are basically any type of sexual activity, including oral, anal, and vaginal sex. And some STDs are bacterial, fungal, or viruses and parasites. <clears throat> Chlamydia. <clears throat> Although there are symptoms for chlamydia, most people do not experience any symptoms at all. But if they do experience symptoms, the symptoms can be burning feeling during urination, <clears throat> abnormal discharge from penis or vagina, lowerable <coughs> abdomen pain, painful intercourse for women, and pain in the testicles for men. The treatment for chlam chlamydia is usually is normally antibiotics. Alright, so I'll be talking about gonorrhea, and just before we start, this is the discharge from uh, chlamydia, and then this is the discharge from gonorrhea. 
uh, gonorrhea is sexually transmitted disease. That's what an STD is. So most common, uh, there's no most com common sim symptom. Uh, as you can see over there, it's a greenish yellowish discharge. Uh, the, before, well for men, uh, before they knew how to extract it, uh, it was called the clap because they would have to clap the penis to make it come out. Um, it is treated with antibiotics. And one medication, it does a lot, I can't pronounce them though, but one medication <laughs> is uh, penicillin. I'll also be talking about syphilis. Um, as you can see from these pictures, you can have little dots uh, on your hand, the palm of your hands and the soles of your feet. Um, there's three stages of it, primary, secondary, and latent stage, uh, sp spread primarily through sexual activity. Uh, so the primary, you develop more sores in the primary stage. Uh, sores are found around the genitals or around the mouth, around the feet and the hands. Uh, they usually come up between three weeks and without treatment they will solve itself, but it takes uh, almost six weeks for that to do so. Uh, syphilis, a single dose uh, of penicillin normally is enough, but if you are allergic to that, you can try tetracycline uh, or doxycycline or another, some, or another medicine uh, prescribed by your doctor. I'll also be talking about genital warts. Uh, everybody's born with them, but not genital warts, normal warts. Uh, it's only called gen uh, HPV when it is in the genital area. Uh, most common STD in North America, and as you can see from here, there's different uh, sizes or shapes of them, and even no symptoms. Not no symptoms, like it's found underneath the skin. Uh, it takes one to three months for them to actually appear, and it is 50% of males and females that are sexually active will get this some point in their lives. <clears throat> I will also now be talking about herpes. Herpes is an infection that causes small blisters around the mouth, which can be called fever blisters or cold sores. The symptoms from this is blisters, rashes, and a fever, and these all can be tr triggered by stress, menstruation, being in the sun, or a fever itself can cause it. Well, bring them up. <clears throat> All right. Now that you have a better understanding of STDs, this is what we've gone through. Chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, HPV and genital warts, herpes, and tra the transmission of all these STDs. Now it's up for Trace and Caitlin. explaining to you how a physician would diagnose you with infertility and this would include a patient interview, possible symptoms, and test or procedures. If you can't read this, it says, do you know about 11% of women who ages 15 to 44 years in the United States have difficulty getting pregnant or carrying a pregnancy to term? regardless of their marital status. Okay, when Georgia and Robert came to us with, the, uh, with their fertility problems, we went over some of their interviews with their doctor. We went over their symptoms, such as uh, Robert's motorcycle crash. Uh, we, we even went over some of their fertility tests to check uh, sperm count and uh, hormone levels. The first thing the physician will do was will have a, a patient interview, which will also be when they ask you questions, which most doctors will do. Uh, the questions will include the medical history, like Georgia had a chlamydia at 18 years of age. They will also talk about your physical and previous physical injuries, which for Robert that will include bull riding and a motor motorcycle accident. They will also uh, question you about your alcohol and drug use. Both tried marijuana once and the your nutrition which is also an effect of infertility. Okay. 
some of the main possible symptoms that we thought would be the cause of their infertility were George's clubbed fallopian tubes. Uh, when Robert wrecked his motorcycle, he damaged his groin. Uh, the George's uh, chlamydia and their drug usage in their early college years and late high school years. After an interview and looking over your possible symptoms, there will be procedures. A basic male infertility procedure would be a semen analysis. Sperm count would be a part of the semen analysis. There will be an, av an average amount or a low sperm count. Sperm morphology is the a percentage of normal sperm to abnormal. And sperm mot motility and mobility, or if they can swim forward or if they go like this. And their speed. Viscosity is the thickness of your semen. And a doctor would also test you for STIs, which would be chlamydia and gonorrhea. Most of these tests are performed with you, uh, urine or blood or saliva. A female infertility test would be a laparoscopic pelvic exam. They will look for endometriosis, <coughs> club fallopian tubes, and blockages. Our diagnosis as a tutor group was endometriosis because of her club fallopian tubes and bone depletion. Okay, as a recap, we went over their symptoms, the patient interview, their fertility tests, and then as our as a group, like Caitlin said, and we decided that uh, endometriosis was the cause of the couple's infertility. And next is Sean and John. <coughs> Hi, I'm Jonathan. I'm Sean, and we're going to be going over infertility treatments. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, some treatments are hormonal pills, which help with pregnancy without all the high-tech, expensive procedures like in vitro or other stuff. That and there's two types of hormonal pills. There's uh, combined estrogen and progesterone. And progesterone only pills that can contain only progesterone. That's the name. Uh, taking hormonal pills gives health benefits. And it gives a lower chance of cancer and ovarian cancer, certain breast lumps, and ovarian cysts. And it can cause severe mental side effects such as suicidal thoughts, intense anger, sadness, etc. In vitro fertilization is when they take uh, eggs and sperm and combine them scientifically outside of the womb and, and it makes what you would call test tube babies, I guess. And the reason why they be called a test tube baby is because in vitro means uh, like glass in another in another in a bottle. Like in a bottle. It means in a bottle. So I'm gonna be talking about endocytoplasm sperm injection, and this is a procedure in which a single sperm is put into a female a female's eggs. And some reports say this makes successful pregnancies. So the sperm is collected through masturbation or surgically. Women, and during this process, if women do this, they get uh, daily injections if they do. Yeah, high ISDSI and lapar laparoscopies are used during this process. And these are mostly used for males when they have extreme cases of infertility. And also I'm going to be going over the laparoscopic electrocauterization, and uh, this is when the doctor will laser out, uh, out endometriosis inside the abdomen and outside the uterus.
this is the most common treatment of endometriosis and it removes scarring from endometriosis which uh, causes pain the scarring does and uh, when the doctors recommend surgery it is usually to view organs for endometriosis or other problems and uh, it is also used to remove cysts like uh, like cystic syndromes, like uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS. And uh, there's also medicines that cure infertility. Like uh, Phoebe said, uh, we have chlorophene, and this stimulates our ovaries to, like, uh, it helps the ovaries to pretty much release eggs. We also have metformin. This uh, helps polycystic ovary syndromes like PCOS. So, the recap is we talked about hormonal pills in vitro in this cytoplasmic sperm injection, laparoscopic electrocauterization medication, and after effects. And next, we have. We have alternative forms of pregnancy with Corbin. Hello, I'm Corbin. I'll be going over the alternate forms of pregnancy with the KTC actually. The topics I'll be covering today, which happen to be split into the categories of options inside your own body, other options which can take place outside your body or in different situations, the cost of some of these options, and how far the couple are willing to go limits your options. First is in your own body. There are inseminations, IUI, which is where they will put a female on hormonal drugs to make her ovulate. And then once she ovulates, they will inseminate her with her partner's sperm inside her own body and see if they can get pregnant that way. There are also embryo donors, which will donate a fully fertilized embryo, which they will then implant into your body. Um, there are sperm donors for uh, single parents and stuff like that. If there's no man, there can be a sperm donor to get pregnant. Egg donors, for if a woman cannot produce eggs out of her own ovaries, you can have egg donors. There is also in vitro IVF, which is they will a woman on fertility drugs to make her produce eggs, and they will then harvest them and uh, fertilize the eggs outside of the body with the partner's sperm. There are also snowflake babies, which are an after result of in vitro. These are fertilized embryos that the couple of IVF did got pregnant off of and left these, oh, these are left over. You, you can then take these and use them to get pregnant yourself. Next is outside your body options. There is a surrogate mother, which is if a woman cannot carry the baby herself, they can go this option, which means they will take your partner's sperm and your egg and make it in, will fertilize it into an embryo and then implant it into another woman's body for her to carry it to term. There is adoption, which is you will take a child and, that is not yours and it is then legally becomes yours. There are two different types of adoption, an open or a closed adoption. An open adoption is where the parents will know who you are, they know, they can visit the child, they usually want to, but then there's a closed adoption which the parents do not know who you are, you do not know who they are, and they give up their child to give it a better life if they don't think they, if they are their best option for it. And then there is also becoming a foster parent or a big brother, big sister, which foster parents, kids will be rotated that are in the system throughout your home where you can then adopt them if you think they fit very well into your home. Then there's also big brother, big sister, which you, a child in the system you take and you go and have fun with them and show them that there is good and stuff out in the world. It wouldn't give you full thing of having a child yourself, but you would still know that you are doing good in a child's life. Next is the cost of some of these. In vitro fertilization can cost $24,000 a cycle, 
which is one try at the fertilization. Uh, then a surrogate can cost $40,000 to bring a baby to full term. As of that site right there, that is what I found out, and that is in Minnesota. I couldn't find one for Wyoming. But $40,000, as you, you have to go through an agency, you find you a surrogate, you have to pay for insurance on the woman just in case she gets hurt or the baby gets hurt, and other health evaluations that are needed. Adoption can go anywhere from $1,000 to $25,000. Um, $1,000 would be if you're donating or adopting someone that is around like toddler age and up, but $25,000 range would be newborn babies and infants and stuff like that where they are uh, not even toddlers yet or year old. It's the fact of your pain for their safety and agency fees and everything to find you an infant. Inseminations can go anywhere from $300 to $4,000, depending on where you go in the United States to get them. Next is how far will the couple go? Really, your options depend on how much to pay, really. With a surrogate, you're paying more, also with in vitro over inseminations. Uh, will they get someone else's child? If they really want a child that is their genes and that, that will limit the options of like an embryo donor or sperm donor down or adoption. As a review, I went over the options in your own body, other options, the cost, and how far the couple is willing to go. And as a conclusion to our presentation, we went over the male reproductive system, the female reproductive system, what causes male, in, male sterility, what causes female infertility, and solutions to infertility. And now would be the question and answer. quite a bit of research um, in a variety of topics. So um, if you do have specific questions for them, uh, feel free to ask now. Some of them may know or uh, might not, so um, they're all the same as well. So first of all, um, congratulations, because this stuff is hard for adults to talk about. So for 9th and 10th graders, you guys did an awesome job. Um, my question, first of all, is um, you talked about normal sperm counts and low sperm counts. So do you know, um, do you have like hard numbers of what those are and the difference? We did research that, but we don't have an exact number. Not off the top of our head, anyway. We yeah. have to go uh, back to our so research. To Does anybody remember um, the sperm count of Robert? Five milliliters. No, it was like 55. It was 55 million in a five. 55,000. 55,000 in a five milliliter testing. Okay, testing. we'll look that one up again. Um, it was 55 million per milliliter, and okay. he produced five milliliter okay. sample. Okay, sorry. There you go. Oops. I was kind of confused about the whole. Okay, we have Georgia and Robert, and then we have a huge spectrum of infertility. So was this supposed to be more directed towards Georgia and Robert, or just a broad spectrum of infertility causes effects and possible solutions? Good. Um, I'll, I'll kind of answer some of that and then um, I'll give it to these guys to answer the rest. Um, part of what they are looking at is trying to identify why Robert and Jordan might be infertile. So um, as we were talking about outside of the room, um, the students kind of look all over the place and then begin to narrow it down. Um, and that's how they're trying to become specific to Robert and Jordan. Um, so as they shared out in the presentation, they had some questions that they could ask specifically to or about the couple. Um, then we had the information from the case study that we could share out with them. Um, the process of that was not necessarily me sitting down and saying, hey, here's all the tests they did, check it out. Um, what they were required to do was ask me specific questions, um, and then I would provide them with that answer. For example, they couldn't say, so what was the semen analysis? I would, they would have to ask me specific information like, um, 
how many, um, what was the um, actual volume of the semen analysis, and then I'd give them that piece of information. Jordan? Yeah. Um, Jordan, where you go? What does HPV stand for? Anybody can answer. I just want to know if you guys know what it means. I looked it up, but I, I can't I know. remember. Human papilloma virus. Kate, and then I have one for Weston as well. Unknown human papilloma virus. On your slide for herpes, you um, focus more on the oral. Where all can herpes show up? Uh, it's It can show up in... I, it's not a, I'm not 100% on this, but it can show up around the mouth, and it, you can get rashes on your body from in certain areas, but I'm not 100% sure on the location. You should so. look it up. You can get it anywhere. Eyes, nose, skin, back, mm -hmm. anywhere. <coughs> Any other questions? I don't know where I'm lost, but... <laughs> um, Sean and Jonathan talked about um, hormonal hormonal pills to be taken. Um, I'm not sure if they were clear on which partner takes these pills. Well, uh, I'm pretty sure both can take them, but it depends on who's having the problem. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's most commonly the female that takes them. Yeah, like uh, what the um, hormonal pills like when we uh, when we put like health benefits. A lot of them, like, like it can treat like breast lumps, or like it can treat and help breast lumps and stuff like that. So I'd say like it, was, it mostly has to do with females. Okay. You guys went through um, that you possibly had thought that the your conclusion was it was a clubbed fallopian tube. Is that correct? Um, I'm not sure that you gave the actual definition of that to us. I'm not sure what that was. Clubbing is basically another word for clogging. Yes. Clogging. Like clogging. Okay. Or blockage. Blockage, got it. How did you guys come to that conclusion? Again, by asking very, by asking a whole bunch of different questions that pertain to the couple, like, and then one of them just we got, we just ended up getting to Georgia and the topic of her reproductive system, and we were asking ourselves whether or not, like, there were problems with a specific part within her reproductive system. And when we asked Mr. Russell if there was anything wrong with their fallopian tubes, he provided us with that information. We, Caitlin, would you like to elaborate on that a little bit more? Well, actually, we found out she had club fallopian tubes by asking if she had a laparoscopic pelvic exam, and then we asked the results of the pelvic exam. I'm wondering, in the conclusion of your findings with Robert, did you decide that his accident and his bull riding didn't really have any effect? Well, it, um, his sperm count was fine afterwards, so there was proven to be no damage after, since his sperm count was normal. At the time, he didn't have blood damage, but then I'm predicting after a while it just came back to normal and he's perfectly fine. Corbin, do you remember um, an average uh, sperm count? Um, an average sperm count is anywhere around 20 million. Per milliliter. And our, our uh, boy Robert had what? 55 million per milliliter. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. When you guys talked about the male sterility, you talked about that um, up to 30% less sperm can be counted given a quart of coke a day. What else did you find that limited or lessened sperm count? It wasn't just coke, it's any soda. Any it's soda, okay. Is it the Was caffeine any... or what is it? Sorry. Is it, what is it that inside the, do you know? The caffeine? Or? I'm pretty sure it was the caffeine, but I didn't read too much into it. Was there any other foods or or medi medicines, etc., that blew up? There, there was like fatty acids that affected, and we, and us, like soy based food. And I, I'm oh, sorry, Sean. It's all right, it's all right. <laughs> all right, and also we learned that the insides of, like, candy wrappers or even the paper that your burger from, like, hamburger stand or something dropped in can have something to do with it. I can't exactly remember everything. I, I can't remember asking. the name of what specific acid caused that either, but I'm pretty sure that specific, like, PFOA acid, I think, was the type of acid inside the linings of popcorn bags and the thing that your, like, the piece of paper that your burger dropped in that could cause up to... Like 80 to, 
I think it was like 124% infertility rates in women. So it can, it's actually very dramatic. So I don't eat junk. <laughs> <laughs> Phoebe, what was the name of that um, drug that helps with ovulation? Like Clomiphene. 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 You guys referred to infertility as a disease. It is, is it a true disease or is it a, just a condition? It's been classified as, as yeah. a disease, yes. According to the CDC. According to the CDC. Good. Um, Phoebe, oh, you. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Phoebe, you <laughs> talked about how you can prevent getting an STI or STD. You use the word monogamous. Now that you're not as nervous, what is monogamy? Monogamy. Do you? I would just tell by my mom. <laughs> <laughs> just for all of our parents' peace of mind, that is not the only way. And monogamy means a situation where the relationship is only the two people that are yeah. allowed to cheat. Yeah. But that is not the only way that you can prevent getting these STDs. Okay. okay. All right. I just tell by my mom because yeah. I was like, so I was talking about it with my parents and, and I was like, Mom, can you still get an STD when you're a virgin? And she was like, no, it's also like a branch, like one of our other guest speakers, <laughs> Mary and I just forgot her name. Uh, Hillary Kay showed us, like I was saying, a presentation. Huh? Not that couple. I thought that was... No, it was not that couple. I just forgot her name. I don't know. The tree was called a shag tree. It was with one partner, and then that partner has... A yes. partner which just goes on to more and more people. Mm -hmm. sure. Shag tree. Shag tree. I like shag tree. 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 Shag
good option had it been you in there to choose? I couldn't imagine. <laughs> well, would you consider one particular choice over another? Um, I would say it depends. Well, in Georgia and Robert's shoes, if, if in fact Georgia did have endometriosis, an, a normal treatment like, she would have to be treated for the endometriosis. Like, in vitro fertilization or artificial insemination wouldn't work if she had endometriosis. So that would first have to be treated, and then they could de decide what other option they would like to try then, after she was treated for endometriosis. And I'd also like to say we actually have not been told her actual diagnosis. Okay, that's what I was going to say. That's, that's like the next two days in their final writing sentence. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so so you're gonna email. If it is possible to use, for you to get pregnant, it's actually harder to carry a baby the full term if you have endometriosis, mm -hmm. meaning your baby can be born premature. Uh, I'd just like to give an example of that. Uh, so, sorry, sorry about this, but uh, yeah, I was premature, and my mom has endometriosis. So was Jordan. Yeah. But his two brothers were not. So I carried two to full term and the last one was premature. And I'd, also, <laughs> and I'd also like to add, I forgot to talk about this, but with endometriosis, it can also be caused by retrograde menstruation, which is where normally when you do menstruation, it goes through your vagina. But retrograde is where it goes backwards through your fallopian tubes, and that can also cause endometriosis because the endometrial tissue goes on the outer parts, and that's how. And also, since they are still part of menstruation, when you're menstruating, they do not have an exit to get out of your body. So that, that's why it can cause clogging and blockage. I, I forgot to talk about that until I thought about it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Corbin, did you look at, um, or did any of you look at, um, the success rates of things like IUI and IVF? They're, they're not very successful. They, like almost all of them, do, I don't even think any of them were 50% of the time. I did not look personally into the success rates, but I do not know about the other people. I would when I did, I've seen one story where it was successful. Okay. That might be something that you guys want to look into in the next couple days. I did look into some success rates, but it also depends on how many times you do these cycles of whatever you do, like with in vitro. Right. Like, but the first time, it's like, it either happens or it doesn't, and so you'd have to do it a couple or a few times in order for it to actually be a really good success. But then again, it's also a lot of money from what Corbin said. Yeah. And the other thing you might want to research, too, is if the stress of the infertility treatment adds to or oh yes and even one of our guest speakers um mary and rodney even talked to us about some of that and it's quite a struggle um my brother and his wife just went through an in vitro process um, successfully and they live way on the east coast in georgia and they used a place down in denver colorado that has some of the highest success rates. It's it's almost a 94% success rate of oh. IVF. Really um, so they were able to fertilize the egg um, and then they sent it off to genetic testing before it ever was implanted into her. So there was like nine fertile eggs, four were not healthy, five were. Um, and then the five that were, were on a grading process. Um, they were all graded on, on the quality of the egg. And then at that point, they implanted one. They would not implant more than one um, because of their success rates being so so high. So then they didn't have to worry about twins and, and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, so one, the one time, and, and it was a go and didn't have any problems and very successful. So. Has she had the baby? Or is she yeah, nope, she's due January. <laughs> but she's back. She At this point, she's considered a full, healthy, normal pregnant yeah. woman. Cool. She's not at high risk or anything. So that's awesome. Yeah, that was pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So how did they find that place? Wrote down Some in my notes, Corbin, that you might want to look at is when you guys talked about know, sperm donors, you mentioned there. that it was single women. You could do it single women or also couples if a man has 
the end of there you the go. Well, if he has trauma to the groin area. Sometimes that's just how it is. Yeah. Or, or, or well, my other accounts are low. Like, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. My they have, they sister, have, sister uh, yeah. she had sperm better, because her and her mm-hmm. is her mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. couple had uh, sperm She is a lesbian, and she had a sperm donor. Mm-hmm. And that's another reason, or another way you could do it. Mm-hmm. But a man and just a married couple can choose. Um, Jordan, you need to elaborate as to why they did that. Did you say that they both had the same sperm donor, so their children oh. would be biologically related? <laughs> okay, that was an important part to that. Because they are a lesbian couple, they could not have children that were genetically linked unless they used the same right. father. So their children are biologically similar. They just have different moms. And there are lots of ways to go about it. If you have enough money. Mm-hmm. You guys talked a bit about um, lessening your chances or <clears throat> or uh, contracting an STD by monogamy. What other ways or means did you guys come up with or research? Abstinence. Abstinence. There you go. Yeah, that's a big one. Being born with it. Uh, <laughs> you can be born with it. Skin contact and even kissing can give you an STD. Sometimes. Not just giving it, but how do you prevent it? Uh, uh, abstinence. Condoms. The protection like condoms. Uh, the birth control. <laughs> Took me a while to think about that. Um, <clears throat> there's spermicide and stuff like that. Just general protection in uh, all ways and forms. It? Or, yeah, no, like, it's all in general. Birth so control will not, not prevent an STD. Sorry. If you know that you have it, and you do it with somebody else, are you are you supposed to tell them that you have this before you do it, or are you yes, just supposed absolutely. to blow it off yes. and let it go? If you're a good person, you're right. I don't know. But not everybody is like that. Not everybody yeah. You can actually sue someone. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the pieces hard. where <laughs> these guys each do... Um, group research as on a daily basis and um, so one of the topics would have been SCDs but it's not something that we spend a week on so they, they get a, a little bit of each section um, and then obviously when they do the presentation they go a little bit deeper but that's kind of the next level of the presentation that we didn't go into as much. That's probably what pertains to a married couple. Right. Mm-hmm. Are there any other questions? You guys did really good. Super informed. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.